Welcome everyone to the third event in the annual Joseph Landy Human Rights Project Distinguished Speaker Series. The series focuses on perhaps the most basic territory for the pursuit of justice, which is the natural environment. We're very proud to welcome several organizers at the vanguard of creating healthier and more just communities for all that live in them. We're extremely proud today to be hosting Tom Shepard, president of the Southeast Environmental Task Force. Before I introduce Tom more fully, I must thank a few of the many people instrumental in bringing us together today. First and foremost, I must thank Joe Loundy. Joe's the founder of the Joseph Loundy Human Rights Project. <laughs> no, I can't. Yes, but Can TV hasn't heard it. Um, and an alumnus of Roosevelt University and the University of Chicago School of Social Service Administration. Even though he'd be the last one to tell you this, uh, Joe's kind of a legend in the Chicago area because there are very few social justice challenges that he hasn't affected for the better. One of the founders of the Center on Halstead, former president of the SSRA Alumni Board and current president of the Roosevelt College of Arts and Sciences Advisory Board. Joe's also president for at least a little while longer of the Chicago Art Deco Society and a major supporter of Southeast Asian arts and culture in the city. He also supports both individuals and specific causes in Cambodia itself and does outreach to senior residential communities and a host of other things that I will not attempt to name all of. Um, the Loundy Human Rights Project is a program that's really unique in the nation in its opportunities for students to do relevant and applicable international human rights research. Taking a multi-pronged approach, we investigate and craft responses to a constellation of mutually implicated social justice challenges. For instance, we examine the sources of environmental injustice this year um, from as many angles as we can, literally and figuratively, from the river, from the heart of abandoned um, and sometimes getting rejuvenated industrial sites in the southeast with Tom a couple of weeks ago, which was an amazing experience, from the vantage points of communities of color who have successfully organized to defend themselves against corporate polluters. We did a wonderful tour of Little Village at the beginning of the semester. In so doing, we aim to identify the most fruitful avenues for pursuit of greater justice, so identifying achievable goals that we can then pursue. We do this in four ways, by learning from top organizers in the field like Tom, by hearing directly from those whose lives have been um, affected by environmental injustices, by providing opportunities for investigation of current environmental injustices, and then by learning from experiences of progressive individuals across the globe. So we travel each year to see firsthand the problems and their potential solutions in other uh, countries. So this year, actually in three days, we're gonna be leaving for Vancouver and Olympic National Park and looking at how there's some really similar challenges around, um, around fossil fuels, around food justice, around access to open space, around water quality um, and toxics in the Vancouver and BC areas. I want to thank in the College of Arts and Sciences, Deans Bonnie Gunsenhauser, um, Julie, uh, Julie Rowan for always helping to get the word out. I would not be able to get the word out without her and her expertise. Um, and uh, to, and um, also to Chris Chulos. Um, and, um, I also want to draw your attention to the final and in some ways kind of the neatest and most unique uh, piece in this series, which is when the students come back from Vancouver and present their comparative research. They want me to not tell you about this so that you forget and don't come, but they're going to be presenting that on the 10th, um, also here, also at 4.30. Um, so that's during finals week, but it's going to be really cool, so you should come and join us. Um, now it's my extreme honor to welcome Tom Shepard. Tom's currently serving as president of the Southeast Environmental Task Force. He's also the longest serving board member of the task force, a native of the area where steel was once king and where there's an abundance of environmental degradation, garbage dumps and contaminated land. Tom's background, extensive background, as an activist and community organizer brought him to work to cure some of those environmental ills in the region. Southeast Environmental Task Force's current campaigns include stopping the Koch brothers' profligate transport and irresponsible management of pet coke on the Calumet River. Tom is one of those rare individuals who seems to be everywhere there's an environmental injustice happening, at key hearings across the state and in various municipal settings, creating solidarity and coalitions across state political and community lines, and connecting with neighbors on an individual basis. 
A very short personal anecdote. Last month, um, as I mentioned, Joe and the students and I were fortunate enough to participate in a sort of succinct version of the Toxics to Treasures tour that um, Tom and the, and the task force offer along the Calumet River. The day before we were scheduled to take the tour, I drove down to the task force's headquarters to familiarize myself with the area, and one of the task force staffers saw me outside and invited me in. Though I hadn't planned to meet with him and therefore hadn't called ahead, and even though they're all incredibly busy, uh, when Tom found out that I was there, he came out and spent a good hour and a half uh, talking with me about what we could expect and explaining the details of some of the current challenges that the task force is taking on so that I could better contextualize that for the students. While we were talking, a couple who lived in the area stopped by to share how much they en enjoyed some of the task force's fall-themed activities in the neighborhood. Tom greeted them and me like old friends, even though he had not met either of us or any of us rather before. His good humor and generosity of spirit and the community that they can foster are examples of some of the most powerful tools that we can wield in fighting corporate power with community power. And I think that that's really important to remember because they're tools that we can all have and all have at our disposal. <laughs> so now please join me in welcoming Tom Shepard. Thank you very much, Bethany, and I'm so glad CAN TV is here today to capture that <laughs> wonderful introduction. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's very much appreciated. I want to uh, um, tell you that um, most of the things that she said about me are true, and uh, I came up um, by getting involved in the environment, uh, environmental movement in our area, uh, just as a, a father and a neighbor, a resident, who had been um, smelling and seeing landfills throughout my whole life and, uh, and other forms of pollution, uh, who used to do a lot of fishing in the area and, and until the uh, streams and rivers and stuff became uh, pretty polluted around us. I didn't come up through uh, academia. I came up in the Vietnam era and started uh, a family early on in life and went to work, went on to working two jobs at the time and uh, raising my kids and taking them out to forest preserves and uh, things like that, I began to acquire a, a real a love of nature and uh, respect for the uh, little bit of wildlife and nature that, uh, that we have in our south side area. We're not, our organization, the Southeast Environmental Task Force, is a uh, small storefront, as uh, I think, uh, Bethany painted a little bit of a picture. We're, we're right on the corner of 133rd in Baltimore, way in the far corner of the city, right near the Indiana border. And uh, we do have people that just walk in. Uh, we're not like in a high rise, and we're not like the Natural Resources Defense Council or, or Greenpeace or the Sierra Club. <coughs> where we have uh, one part-time employee, and the rest of us are, including myself, are volunteers with the organization. And, uh, but we do, I have to say we do an awful lot and, and we're going to get to some of our accomplishments uh, as the PowerPoint goes by. And this is a rather primitive PowerPoint. I probably did my first PowerPoint maybe about a year and a half, two years ago, and I still fumble around. I had a lot of help from our director, Peggy Salazar, in putting it together and um, uh, taking some photographs that I thought would best uh, uh, picture or paint a, a picture of the southeast side and what we're going through today. At uh, one point in about 10 or 15 minutes uh, in, uh, we're going to see a short film. It's a very professional uh, uh, film that was put on by Vice TV, Vice News. Anybody out here that's heard of Vice News? Okay, a few of you, and I know Bethany's already seen it, but it's uh, it really depicts the, uh, our current battle of uh, the uh, pet coke, the petroleum, the pet coke is petroleum coke. It's, it's a byproduct of the refining process of the tar sands that we're now getting an awful lot of, uh, particularly at the British Petroleum BP refinery in Whiting, Indiana, which is just a few miles from where our office is located. And the, uh, that byproduct is making its way across the border coming to Chicago and the Calumet River because of the uh, convenience of the Calumet River and uh, rail and so forth. Uh, but also because Indiana has some very strict regulations 
on that product, which uh, Chicago and Ill the state of Illinois had not had until uh, our uh, magnificent campaign began about a year and a half ago. And uh, we affected uh, quite a change in the, in the city and regulating the, not only the pet coke, but a lot of the other bulk materials that we find along the uh, Calumet River will be treated to seeing some of those uh, as we get into that film. So uh, I guess we can get right into it. And uh, I, I did, uh, just to expound on what Bethany said, I, I did come into the Southeast Environmental Task Force in 1999 when uh, waste management, most of you probably have heard of waste management or dealt with them, maybe they do your trash collection and stuff. They have some huge landfills out by us that um, during our early campaigns, uh, even before I came on with the task force, uh, we were founded in 1989, so we're celebrating our 25th anniversary uh, right around the first of the year. And um, the first big battles were on getting landfill, landfill moratorium in the city of Chicago. Uh, but they were going to open a uh, hazardous waste incinerator out by us. And uh, right on the shores of the Cal Lake Calumet, where I did some of that fishing back when I was in my teens and 20s. And uh, that's what finally drew me in when I had read about the horrific things that they were going to be uh, incinerating there and uh, they, they did actually open that incinerator. They got the permit to open it and uh, our organization along with um, a coalition of, of a lot of other environmentalists around the city came together to fight against that and, and uh, it wasn't but for a couple of explosions that they had out there and workers being injured that they lost their permit and had to close down and, and that building's been shuttered ever since. Uh, but that was my first experience and I had read about this little band of mighty people who were uh, taking matters into their own hands and, and fighting pollution in our corner of the city and they were going to uh, chain themselves to the building and, and to the fence I mean and prevent the uh, trucks from coming in and out of there and uh, uh, that's that's when I thought well sounded like a fun thing to do and <laughs> and an effective thing to do. Uh, I, I began to uh, have a personal hero uh, who was one of the founders of our Southeast Environmental Task Force and that was Marion Burns who I didn't meet until uh, that year but I had been reading about her for a number of years in the newspaper and she was a student of the Saul Alinsky and maybe some of you have heard about Saul Alinsky and, and his tactics of uh, of uh, nonviolent uh, demonstrating and protests and so forth. And uh, uh, her coupled with uh, State Representative Clem Balanoff, uh, she worked to get him elected. He was a reform candidate and fought against the machine. Um, most of you probably have heard of the Chicago, the mighty Chicago machine. And, and uh, Clem got elected and he formed this um, environmental committee as part of his his office and uh, Marion Burns um, was was his assistant, and she went on to become the environmental icon in the Calumet. In fact, I think uh, in Nature magazine uh, called her the conscience of the Calumet, and uh, so she was my mentor, and, and uh, I, I was uh, came in under her and used to pick her up every morning. She didn't drive; she took the bus uh, everywhere she went, pick her up, and. And uh, after we had to stop in an alley and feed all the kittens and, and uh, feral cats out there, we would come to the office and take on the day's challenge. And uh, I was fortunate that I um, had some time on my hands and became uh, almost a full-time volunteer, you might say, today. So uh, we're going to do some of the slides that will talk about our organization and, and what we do and what we have done and what we still intend to do and then onto a film. So I'm gonna to have to walk around because I'm not quite sure what to do with this here. Our mission, um, inform and educate members uh, of the community. We have three primary, if you wanna read that out, I'll, I'll tell you we have three primary missions and those are uh, pollution prevention, environmental education, and open space enhancement. We're promoting things like 
um, converting ground fields. Ground fields are what the steel mills left in their wake as they left, and chemical companies and, and other major polluting industries. Uh, so we're, we're promoting walking paths, bike paths, and, and other things like that. And uh, our vision, uh, we want to, uh, Chicagoland to serve as a national and international model for the integration of industrial, residential, and natural areas. We recently have a new company that's located in the neighborhood near where I live. I live in the historic Poland district, and it's called Method Products. Anybody familiar with that? Especially, okay. Uh, generally, the ladies know about it because it's sold in Target stores, and uh, it's a, it's a uh, soap and lotions and things like that. And they're, it's a LEED certified building, and they have a wind generator out there. They have a big, huge windmill. This is at 111th and the I-94, the Bishop Ford Expressway. And uh, they have solar panels and uh, geothermal. So they're going to be the model that, that we're going to um, use to uh, hope to entice other businesses that locate in our area to follow that model. And our values are uh, we want to work with all members of the community to embrace environmental justice and sustainable growth. So this is uh, kind of shows what our entire area, you, you have to think of um, an area much larger than the size of the loop, or if you combined, uh, uh, let's say, Ravenswood and, and Bucktown and Ukrainian Village and several of those neighborhoods, put them all together, uh, they would form the 10th Ward. The 10th Ward, out by us, is the largest ward in the city of Chicago. Probably has more, or it does have more open space than all of the other 49 wards combined. So we're, we're a large area with a lot of open space, and at one time, most of it looked like this, um, all the way from the shores of the Lake Calumet, where I live in Pullman, all the way to Lake Michigan, was a series of wetlands, ponds, streams, and so forth, and uh, very pristine like you see in this picture. And later on, after the steel mills began to arrive in 1874, that was the first one was brown steel, which became Wisconsin steel at 106 in Torrance, and uh, that's where my father spent his career of uh, about 37 or 39 years working in the plant. Um, well, I did have a pointer, but somewhere along the way. Here it is. Um, I'll get around to that. Uh, Wisconsin Steel, and then uh, later was joined by a number of other steel companies. Most of the names you might be familiar with, U.S. Steel, which still exists. And then a number of them that uh, went bankrupt and closed up until there's no longer any steel, major steel production anyway on the southeast side. We had Republic Steel, LTV Steel, Interlake Steel, Acme Steel. U.S. Steel closed up. They still have a plant in Gary. And Wisconsin Steel, which closed around 1980 or so and uh, just tossed all the men out of work uh, when they left. So this uh, shows the Calumet River. Let's get real modern here. So here's the Calumet River, and as it winds up, it comes in from Lake Michigan at 92nd Street. So it comes down, and it actually comes all the way around, and then goes out into, uh, into the Illinois River, and uh, down near Joliet. And uh, Illinois goes, of course, down into the Mississippi River, and all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. So there, there's a series, there's a lock and dam down here at about 134th Street, and a whole series of locks and dams. And a lot of uh, commerce comes up this river. Um, at one time fed the steel mills, grain elevators. Um, the industry has changed quite a bit. Um, we used to have a whole lot more barge and freighter traffic, but today we have uh, mostly concrete and the product called pet coke that I talked about. I think this is one of the, this, is that the general, does that look like General Mills to you? Yeah. So yeah, that, and they have a slip that went right in there. I'm pretty sure that is. But General Mills even left, and and most of the uh, agriculture, the uh, grain elevators and stuff, uh, were shuttered back around 1979. So this whole area really declined 
right around in the 70s and early 80s. Am I getting bad feedback because I'm standing in front of it? No, it's okay. All right. So anyway, here's uh, what some, some of the property looks like today. This is a remnant of the steel industry. This is the Acme Steel Coke plant, which uh, we had an effort. Um, I was talking with uh, somebody about the Illinois Labor History Society up on the 13th floor. I think he had to leave. Had to leave but, yeah. um, I belong to a group called the Southeast Historical Museum, Southeast Chicago Historical Society, and the Illinois Labor History Society, and the Steelworker Retirees uh, Organization. And we tried to save this plant. Um, in fact, we I think we lost about one hundred and five thousand dollars that we had. We we had to achieve like over two hundred thousand dollars and. Uh, we had possession of it for a little while and it was deteriorating. There were buildings on it. We wanted to make a steel museum because it was the last structure uh, that was left on the southeast side that uh, was a steel producing facility. So today, uh, those two smokestacks are still out there. So it's uh, uh, really interesting and just, just the skeleton of a few other things. And of course, this uh, land down here is highly polluted, which is one of the reasons why we couldn't, uh, we were unsuccessful. The EPA just about told us to get out of there and, and uh, don't step foot on there again. And the city wasn't too fond of the idea either. They didn't want, they didn't think the Steel Museum was going to be a, um, a popular uh, attraction and plus it was polluted. So this is uh, some of the industry that we still have today and some for those of you that were out on the tour a few weeks back, this is the refinery at um, the British Petroleum Refinery in Whiting, Indiana. It's really rather striking, I would, I would think you would all agree, all of you that came out there that day. This facility is, uh, oh gosh, uh, I, should, I should have looked it up, but it, it encompasses maybe around five square miles, something like that, maybe maybe a little less than that, four square miles of refining and uh, uh, all kinds of processing, storage tanks, and uh, it's just a big, huge facility. And you can see how uh, what it dumps into the air, and it also has a lot of uh, pollutants that go into our Lake Michigan. And another little picture, and the reason why I like this one because it shows you the proximate, the distance from downtown. It almost looks like this is interposed out there, but Lake Michigan is right out here. And here's that Calumet River that I talked about that empties out into the lake at 92nd Street. And one of the slips, and uh, uh, this is some of the commerce that's still there today. Uh, but a lot of a lot of this area that's uh, actually nature trying to make a comeback over here. You can see some of the greenery back around here and here. At one time, that was just all uh, uh, either factory buildings or or um, covered with slag. Most of the uh, southeast side has been dumped on by the steel mills by a product uh, called slag, which is a waste product from the steel mills, which is like a cinder. Um, combination of coal and limestone and little bits of iron ore and stuff that didn't make it through the steel making process. So it's a huge amount of waste, an enormous amount of waste. And they had to do, I think right up here, in fact, there might be some of the piles left from, um, did we see the slag piles while we were out there? Did we get a chance? Because yeah. we still had some mountains of it. And uh, uh, when, when the steel companies left, they just, folded up and the, they still remain there today. In fact, we're not quite sure what we're going what they're going to do with them. And uh, bringing us to back along the river, this is what the pet coke looks like. And it gets uh, loaded onto these freighters. It comes in by barge from three different refineries, the British Petroleum Refinery in Whiting and a uh, mobile refinery in Joliet and a uh, Sitco refinery out in Lamont comes down in barges, uh, by truck, and by rail. And uh, this is the Skyway, Chicago Skyway in the background here. And uh, so the piles had been uh, up to 60 feet tall, and then the city came down on them just about a year ago, last December, and uh, uh, initiated a number of regulations. And one of the chief regulations that they did uh, 
uh, a resolution was that the piles could be no higher than 25 feet, and that did affect a lot of the uh, fugitive dust that we're getting in the neighborhood. And uh, so we don't have quite as much as, as we had before. <coughs> this is what it looks like. I mean, this is, uh, looks like coal, and it's very, very close in, in, uh, in its makeup of uh, as coal. It's uh, about 97% pure carbon. And uh, if you ever saw the tar sands um, and how the tar sands are mined up in Alberta, Canada, it's, it's really a, a whole hideous operation how it uh, gets, they just scrape the whole forest and uh, take all the trees off and then scrape the ground and then the stuff gets put into a slurry of a combination of water, an enormous amount of water used to pipeline it across the country and uh, comes down and, and uh, gets distributed or gets pipelined into the refinery. And this is a waste product. About 33% of the tar sands that gets pumped out end up becoming this petroleum coke or pet coke as we refer to it. And it's right along the banks of the river. So, so this is the river bank right down here. And you might imagine that after a heavy rainstorm, a lot of the water runs off and, and pollutes the river, which is connected to Lake Michigan, as I pointed out a couple times already, which is the drinking water for millions of people. And another thing that we have a proliferation of today are scrapyards. And some of them grew up on, you can see this is part of the old Interlake steel blast furnace in the background. As I said before, most of the buildings, uh, the steel making buildings have been taken down, but this one is still in use as a uh, storage and, and uh, warehousing and stuff like that, uh, but not steel related. But this is uh, right on the, on the Calumet River. I think we were up there on a tour and saw it up close. And, and when that stuff gets unloaded and offloaded, unfortunately, a lot of it gets dumped into the river. Very unsightly. So I think that's going to bring us to the point where we're going to uh, see the short film. and. Uh, I have to walk over there to, to press the button. So uh, the pet coke, uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, we had a major storm. Well, first of all, I'll, I'll say that we, our organization was invited out to take a tour of a, a building across the, of, of business across the river, uh, which is also related to the BP refinery. It's a liquid asphalt uh, facility. And while we were out there, we had a vantage point, a view that we, normally wouldn't be accustomed to, because we were seeing it from across the river where there used to be Wisconsin steel. When we got out there, we saw these huge mountains of black crud that we had no idea were there. We had been fighting coal for a long time, trying to get the coal facilities along the river to clean up their rack and to uh, minimize the amount of uh, dust and stuff in the air. And we thought most of the coal had gone, but we couldn't see what they had back on this property and, and the uh, property owned by the uh, Coke Industries, Coke Carbon Industry, which is owned by, and I always put Notorious in front of their name, the Notorious Coke Brothers. <laughs> and then when we saw that, we, we just looked at one another and we said, we've got to find out what this is and if this is going to cause a problem. Well, we found out this was just the beginning of things when the um, BP refinery uh, concluded their enormous uh, expansion project, a $4 billion project, the largest uh, industrial project in the state of Illinois, Indiana's history uh, to accommodate refining of tar sands that we were gonna be getting hit with like 2.7 million tons of this petroleum coke annually. And that uh, when these other two refineries from Joliet and Lamont started bringing their stuff in, it would result in between nine and 11 million tons per year. It's a lot of product. and. You can see the stuff there in the background. You'll see the rest on the, uh, the film, which is done by Vice TV News. Everybody loves energy. Nobody wants it in their backyard. It's just the nature of the beast. It's something we deal with all the time. 
nothing we can do to stop that, but we just try to remind people of the big picture. Our modern society, more than ever before, relies on electricity and energy to move around and to play and to live. So we need to find the best way possible to generate, transmit, and transport those energies in a way that people have a quality of life around them. We're here in Whiting, Indiana at the BP facility right outside Chicago, which is just this massive industrial wastelands. And soon it's gonna be home to the second biggest petroleum coker in the United States of America. And what that means for the residents of Chicago, uh, we're about to find out. The Alberta tar sands are about 2,000 miles from Chicago, but they might as well be in the backyards of the people of the city's southeast side. Petroleum coke, or pet coke, a byproduct of the oil refining process, is piling up on the banks of the Calumet River and blowing into the adjacent neighborhoods. KCBX Terminals, a subsidiary of Coke Industries, is storing the dusty byproduct after it's shipped across the state line from the BP refinery. Late last year, the Illinois EPA hosted a public meeting to discuss a proposal to expand KCBX's storage facility. The company needed more space to accommodate BP's growing output. My granddaughters, all her clothes pitch black. That's not her. Needless to say, people were angry. Either your people in Blackhawk are not doing their homework, or you're not doing your homework. This is legal, toxic waste. They're lying to you. I mean, they're lying. Even the newspaper doesn't cover everything. You gotta read between the lines. That whole process, it's almost like they put it back on the community. Like, okay, we know that you guys are experiencing something, but here's what you can do about it. And it's like, no, what are you going to do for uh, us? Mm -hmm. When do we catch a break? You know, when can we, you know, relax with our families at the park? You know, we, we can't. We have to keep doing this work. But this is how it is. This is what you do. This is, this is, you know, we, we can't just sit by and let this shit happen, right? But we also have to connect this to bigger and broader issues that are happening not just here in South Chicago, but throughout the country and in the world. We are at a crossroads in the United States. Presidential approval for the construction of the Keystone XL pipeline is pending. And for better or worse, Communities throughout America will be awash with oil from the Canadian tar sands if the pipeline is approved. Supporters promise cheaper fuel and a reduced dependence on foreign oil from less friendly countries. Critics fear more damage to an already fragile environment. But Kate showed me a tangible example of what was to come if heavier oil continues to be imported and refined in the United States. So you can see that it's really just the residue off of the the, the lid. Um, oh, it's really fine. Yeah, yeah. Kinda... So it blows around easy. When you put it on your hand, it leaves a residue. It doesn't wipe off like dirt. Like you have to go and scrub your hands with soap and water after this. How did you so um, another group went on to the, the north site, the KCBX north site, and they just scooped it up and then they got kicked off. But you can, uh, you can show me where it is? Yeah. So it's on the 100th Street Bridge. You could see this large black area. Yeah, that is a big, big. Pile. And so this is the bridge. This is a ma major, you know, thoroughfare. Mm -hmm. And then this is the 106th Street Bridge right here. And this is the site they just acquired. So basically, where that, this pin is here. And then where this pin is here, that's all owned by the Koch brothers. And where are we right now? This is where we live. It actually this is, is about a, quality I mean, of human life and disrespecting it mm -hmm. and, and devaluing it. I still have this stuff. I can't get this stuff off my fingers. Yeah, well, you're gonna have to wash. All right, yeah, I'm gonna go wash my hands. Pet coke, like coal, can be burned to generate energy, but it creates more pollution. The EPA is no longer granting permits for the burning of pet coke in the United States. 
but it's stored in Chicago before being exported abroad to be burned in countries with less environmental regulation like China. So is this a waste product or a product? Pet coke is a byproduct of the oil refining process. The key is that it's not a hazardous waste. It's not a waste product. Yeah, it's a um, residual carbon, really just a, a waste product of petroleum refining. It's mainly a carbon particle, so I guess it would be most analogous to coal dust. Um, and so it is not just a nuisance, it's more than a nuisance. Coal dust and carbon particles have been shown to cause fibrosing lung disease, which means scars in your lungs. It's been shown to cause emphysema, just as if you smoke. This kind of particulate, or dusts, can really cause problems. And as an occupational lung specialist, we see um, lots of groups of workers that have uh, inhaled dust as part of their jobs who get um, over met a long time and get very severe and serious lung diseases. Well, this is the waste stream from one of the dirtiest oils known to planet Earth. It is filled with all kinds of residue from sulfur to heavy metals. And this is just the beginning. When they're up and running, they will be pumping out 6,000 tons a day. What will happen with that? BP recently spent $4.2 billion to upgrade its refinery to handle heavier oils. Its petroleum coker, the second largest in the world, is scheduled to come online in late 2013. When it does, residents fear that the dust will only increase as more pet coke is transported across the state line into Illinois for storage. I hopped a boat with Peggy Salazar and Tom Shepard from the Southeast Environmental Task Force to see where the pet coke was piling up. So these barges where you see they're covered up, pretty much those are all going to be carrying pet coke from the BP refinery over here. Now some days the entire river has been cluttered up with the barges. The neighborhood starts a half a block from that pile. Right on the other side of those piles is a community. So how long has this been an industrial hub for, though? Is this going back generations? Well, 1874 was the first steel mill. That was Wisconsin Steel. It was originally called Brown Steel. And then all along the river, different industries started growing up around that time and all throughout the whole 20th century. And uh, around the 70s and 80s, the steel and, and up to the 1990s, steel started uh, closing up and getting out of here, out of South Chicago. But there's no more mills around here today, you know, but now we're still being dumped down with this so stuff. So now you got the terrible pollution, but no jobs to go with it. That's exactly. Right. I say it's an environmental justice issue because whiting is predominantly white compared to our neighborhood. Our neighborhood is majority minority, and so it's just dumped here any place. As you can see, it's dumped all over on us. You know, to be perfectly honest with you, I think that they just thought that this was gonna go under the radar, wouldn't yes. you say? Yeah. I mean, that's how stuff gets done around here. You can see that there's at least, at least how many blocks long, a train of open cars with this stuff piled in there. They're not covered when they're moving? No. Doesn't look like it. No. And that's a long ass train. <laughs> that's, a, mm. that's a long train. Well, now you yeah. see how much comes in. The stuff that I was playing with earlier today it doesn't seem like that's gonna stay put. No. I can only imagine what the banks of the Calumet River would look like after BP's coker comes online. But this neighborhood had a long industrial history. How was pet coke different than other things stored and manufactured here? What were the real risks associated with its storage? I sat down with some local experts to find out. There was no warning given to the community. Uh, and I think this is one of the problems, is that this is a different type of material in the midst of this community, and there is a certain amount of complacency among officials that this is what happens in the southeast side of Chicago. It's a sacrifice zone, and you can dump stuff there. If you're gonna stop this from happening there, isn't that gonna kinda kill off a lot of jobs that are in the community? Uh, this will not kill off any jobs in the community. There really are no jobs associated with this, and this is what's different about this. 50 years ago, you had 300,000 people employed at U.S. Steel. Today, how many people are employed there? None. 250,000 down the street at Wisconsin Steel. Today, none. So you've had a whole range of highly productive industrial economy where 
you had the creation of, a, of, of, of the social compact that defined America in the post-war period, where you had high-paying jobs, where people could earn a serious middle-class income, have health care, have pensions, all of which they had reason to rely upon. Good schools and a future for their families and children. This pet coke is the opposite of that. It is an attack upon the community, not a way to create an avenue and bridge forward to 21st century economy. If we went by that, it would, we wouldn't have people in any industry anywhere. There are going to be people next to certain industrial activities, whether it's energy or manufacturing, that aren't engaged specifically in that process. That doesn't mean the process shouldn't happen. It means the process should be done safely, but that doesn't mean that just because they don't get a direct benefit of that job from that plant, doesn't mean that industry, sh industry shouldn't exist in that area. Both businesses, like the people who are dumping pet coke here, and uh, some government and regulatory entities think that well, this has been a dumping place before, we can make that happen again. This is not unrelated to the future of many, many, many communities in the United States and elsewhere. It's not just something that's fetched up on the southeast side of Chicago. We're looking at this happening in St. Louis, we're looking at it in Houston, we're looking at it in Toledo town after town, city after city, where as this dirty tar sands oil comes in the United States, more and more communities are going to be directly affected in their backyards. That's not specific to the oil sands of Canada, it's specific to oil of any kind. So I know some people are making this issue about oil from Canada, which we have a lot of in Illinois, um, but if we stopped all the oil from Canada, we would still have pet coke because it comes from the oil refining process. So it's not a hazardous waste, it's not specific to Canadian oil. The focus here is the dust. There aren't long-term studies of the uh, health effects of pet coke in particular. So I think it would be incorrect to just say because there's no studies that it's healthy. You know, it's mainly a waste product and um, there haven't been long, large cohorts of people working with it to know. But that doesn't mean that it's safe. So I think, why would we want this in our neighborhoods? And why would we want to wait for a community-based outbreak of worsening asthma or other diseases instead of just mitigating this exposure? It just seems silly. The key issue is, is that dust coming from the pet coke piles. If it is, then we have to find ways to do, the, the companies have to find ways to suppress the dust better. But where else could it be coming from? Well, it's an industrial area. It could be, it could be I mean, I have, I, I'm not gonna speculate where it comes from. People make the assumption it comes from those piles. And that's not always the case. Isn't there a way to test it to kind of see where? And that's what they're doing now. I thought that film pretty much talked about our, our big challenge today uh, for our, our organization and for the, uh, the neighborhood on the southeast side of Chicago. The big challenge is dealing with that. And uh, as I said in the last clip there, that in December of last year, the city adopted a number of uh, regulations on the pet coke, and uh, mostly about the height restriction. Uh, setbacks from the river and setbacks from the neighborhood. Uh, they had to clean up their properties and they, uh, the chief among all the regulations is that they're going to have to enclose the entire um, operation the piles, the, uh, the conveyors, the unloading, the offloading, everything is going to have to have a, a system to encapsulate. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, to uh, cover up and encapsulate the whole operation so that the dust isn't able to uh, uh, migrate off the off the uh, properties. So anyway, that brings us to uh, you know where we want to go and and what our programs. I talked a little bit about our environmental education and our our watchdogging. Uh, I think uh, Bethany met one of our watchdogs at the office who uh, finds 
things like fly dumping, we depend on other people in the neighborhood. Even whistleblowers within companies have called our company to let us know about things uh, that are going on that, that shouldn't be, and, and uh, that's uh, what we get on, on a regular basis, our neighbors and others calling us to do something about it. There's a lot of green on this map, and this is part of our uh, uh, open space plan and our vision for, for the area. Uh, we've had a number of organizations working with us, the Friends of the Parks, the Friends of the Forest Preserves, the Sierra Club, um, uh, the Field Museum, and a number of others to map out places where, um, and we're making a lot of, a lot of progress. Uh, just recently, and I think it's on a future clip, but I live right over here in the Pullman neighborhood, and this is Lake Calumet that I referred to a few times. This is Wolf Lake which is a bi-state lake, and this is just about the Indiana-Illinois border over here. So Lake Michigan would be just off the map a little bit. And as I pointed out before, in between was all pristine wetlands at one time. And uh, recently the state of Illinois just bought a uh, big hunk of this property and back over here uh, for $9 million, they're going to reopen Lake Cayman. That's been closed off to the public. Uh, for industry uses and a golf course that they put in over here at Big Marsh here and we're helping to promote a uh, BMX bike park over here and uh, this cluster site we're working with a uh, solar company to develop what would be the largest um, inner city solar farm in the country right here Indian Ridge Marsh over here is undergoing a two million dollar restoration by the Army Corps of Engineers over here at Hegwish Marsh, the uh, city of Chicago, uh, with a uh, $6 million investment from the Ford Motor Company, which Ford has its plant right here, uh, <coughs> developing an environmental center, similar to up on the north side where they have, um, I forgot what it's called, North, north Village or something like that? North Park Village. North Park Village, thank you. And uh, Powderhorn Lake, this is all forest preserves around over here. And this is the only state park within the city of Chicago limits here, the William Powers State Park and Wolf Lake. Uh, so a lot of uh, opportunity over here for, and I might mention that um, pretty soon Historic Coleman is going to be designated either a national park or a national monument. Uh, they say that President Obama is going to do that before Thanksgiving, so that'll be a nice holiday uh, gift for the neighborhood. And uh, let's see, this is, uh, with, this is a, a number of open space photographs from the area. And the black crown night heron, which is on the endangered, the uh, threatened species list in Illinois. And beautiful wetlands. And we see over here the, uh, the remnants of the old uh, railroad bridge and the rivers and more wetlands and an aerial view. And here's that Lake Calumet that I referred to. I was very proud to be out there a few weeks back when Governor Quinn came out and made the announcement that this would once again be restored and open to the public for fishing and hiking, camping, <coughs> bird watching. And this is a photo of Wolf Lake. And right across the lake, by the way, on the Indiana side, very close to the BP refinery. And some of the things that, that we do, uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, uh, conferences that we sponsor. Uh, here we had the uh, uh, administrator for the EPA, Susan Hedman, come out to uh, have a view of the operations at the river. This was where we brought legislators out and showed them uh, the dangers of pet coke. This was early on in our pet coke battle. We brought the aldermen, the um, city state administrators out, the governor. Senator Durbin was out with us, uh, U.S. Representative Kelly and U.S. Representative Quigley. And uh, kids over here doing one of their environmental projects that we program. Um, some of the highlights of what we've done throughout the years, we fought off the uh, Lake Caddy Mountain, was supposed to be converted to an airport a number of years ago, and uh, uh, that never occurred. That was ill-fated plan. 
they were going to fill in that whole lake and uh, put an airport and move out about 100,000 people from the area, but that didn't go anywhere. Uh, we opposed a uh, landfill at O'Brien Lock. In fact, we got a moratorium on the um, uh, any more dumping in Cook County. Uh, closed that incinerator that I talked about, that hazardous waste incinerator. Uh, at one time, there was a project to bring napalm from around the country to East Chicago to be incinerated, and uh, we were a part of the campaign to stop that. Uh, landfill moratorium, we got a 20-year moratorium on landfills, which told the uh, garbage companies that uh, they're out of business in Chicago and Cook County. Uh, this indoor firing range, that was uh, uh, one of our uh, most successful campaigns, and, and it wasn't that we did so well, it's just that we had been fighting the Chicago Police Department. They were going to do uh, 33 acres, they were going to put a firing range and a um, practice area where they were going to have bombs going off and crowd control and all the crazy things, helicopters landing. and. And we said, that's on our green plan. You can't do that there. Well, we were about to lose that battle when uh, just by chance or divine intervention, the American bald eagle uh, appeared on that property during a, uh, <laughs> during a, a WBEZ uh, public radio uh, tour of the site and the story that uh, one of the reporters were doing. And we followed that eagle and found that it, that it, has, uh, it was nesting there. We immediately contacted U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and the city had to back down. So that area is closed off now. <laughs> and uh, one of our big, uh, big campaigns was to, uh, on, on one of those properties. A company called Lucadia was going to come up and continue bringing coal to our area, and, and we rallied the neighborhood, uh, joined with the Sierra Club Beyond Coal campaign, and a number of other organizations. And uh, we were able to get uh, Governor Pat Quinn to uh, veto a bill that would have permitted that. Uh, got the countywide landfill moratorium in 2012 passed through the legislature. And uh, the, the city regulations regarding the storage of pet coke and other bulk materials along the river. Uh, by the way, we just found out that uh, Coke Industries signed a contract just last week to spend $100 million on that operation there. So we think that's a little feather in our cap that we made them spend that money to just be responsible neighbors. It's a lot of money. And the uh, Millennium Reserve is, was an initiative by uh, Governor Quinn and uh, Mayor Emanuel and a number of uh, agencies to begin to work on what we showed you was our plan for uh, uh, recreational use of a lot of the brown fields and a lot of the open space out in our area. So just some pictures and uh, depicting what we do. We bring people out. We uh, do have stewardship days and uh, to appreciate, oh, pressing the wrong buttons here. And uh, we promote ecotourism by a, a number of tours throughout the year. We have our standard tours and we also do them for, for schools, uh, elementary schools, high schools, and higher levels of education. And a few more things. Uh, you see some of the fish that they take from these lakes and other, other types of nature. And guess what? We even have a picture of those nesting eagles. Here's a close-up as one comes in for a landing. Not the best picture, but uh, it's hard to get an eagle in flight. Believe me. So uh, our motto, I guess, is uh, never to give up. We're still fighting these battles, and we continue to. And we can use your help, of course. Well, we want you to, I'll, I'll leave this one up as we finish up, in case you want to take our website or our Facebook page down, our blog spot. So uh, that's, uh, that concludes my uh, presentation. And I'm uh, hoping for, do we have a little bit of time for we, any Q&A? Yeah, we do. We have, yeah, it's only 4.38, so if we've got good time, we'll get to it. Oh, so. well, I, I don't know if they're going to have that many questions, <laughs> but I, you might be surprised. Yeah. yeah. Are you guys involved at all 
in, or have any commentary on the whole Lakeside Center development of the old U.S. Steel site? Yes, some, yes. Uh, we, we were a partner of the Friends of the Parks in the city of Chicago to make sure that they set aside an awful lot of uh, park space out there, first of all, and that they would maintain the shoreline as, as parks, as, uh, as, uh, as uh, outlined in the Burnham Plan, and that they wouldn't be building right up to the, um, to the water's edge. We're also a partner with the Southeast Alliance um, developing uh, community benefits, um, CAP's uh, plan or program, and uh, we're, we're looking because they have such a huge investment there and they're going to have such an impact on the area around there, including what a lot of people are fearing, and that's gentrification and, and people being priced out of their very modest homes that, as you can, as you know, that was U.S. Steel and all around there, there's a lot of um, very old structures and uh, low-income uh, homes around there. So a community benefits agreement was what I was looking for before. And one of, the, one of the things that we're asking for, because they, they've got an awful lot of tax incentives and a lot of our own money invested in there, is that they give some of that back and help work with us on, on a plan for a green economic corridor, uh, starting where they're at and then kind of uh, snaking along the Calumet River so that we can attract a different type of industry out in our area rather than some of the dirty things that we saw in the film today. Yeah. Has the South Shore Drive expansion harmed or benefited your efforts? That goes right through the area that she was talking about. Um, well, uh, if you've ever driven from downtown to get out to the southeast side and had to come through South Shore and through coming through that neighborhood, it was pretty rough uh, to maneuver all that area there and. And I think it's really helped with the flow of traffic. And um, hey, there had been nothing happening on that property since the 1980s. And uh, you know, it's, uh, it's progress. Uh, I think that uh, once they start turning shovels over there, and the first thing they're gonna do is put a Mariano's in. And uh, that neighborhood had been clamoring and, and needing uh, a nice shopping store there rather than these corner places that sell mostly hot fries and uh, Coca-Cola and stuff like that. So, you know, the Mariano shows that they're, they're going to do the right thing, I think, over there. Uh, the, the fact that they're putting in new parks and uh, uh, they've landscaped very nicely. And you can drive out there. I encourage anybody to go out there and drive to 87th until you can't go any further and you have a magnificent view of the downtown area. And to see Lakefront with nothing on it is, is just, it's, it's an unbelievable view. And by the way, you can look the other way to uh, Northwest Indiana and see a whole uh, uh, horizon with uh, the steel mills and the uh, BP plant and everything. It's pretty remarkable, you know, both ways. So I think it's, it's gonna benefit the whole area. Yes. Uh, what do you think some of the campaign was so successful? Say again, please. What do you think made the campaign, some of the campaign so successful? Is there anything specific made the campaign successful? Yeah, can I actually piggyback on that? Because yeah. I was kind of going to ask a similar question. When I saw that list of yes. victories, mm -hmm. I thought, oh, look at all, like A, that's really nice to remember that that happens. And B, like, I saw a bunch of really great data points. And I was wondering kind of, what were like what were the couple of most like if you looked at that whole string yeah. and then you thought about like kind of what determines when you guys have succeeded and failed? What would you say are the couple of most important variables there? Yeah. Uh, so the question, uh, what are, are some of the most important things that, that we have been working on? And well, you know, the things that have been most important in determining when you've succeeded yeah. versus when not. Okay. Well, I'd say our successes were mostly with the landfills, uh, working on the landfills that was in our, in our earlier days, uh, stopping landfills, because we, we were getting the brunt of garbage from the city and uh, uh, industrial waste that, that couldn't be helped. That's the, the mills and everybody else producing all the industrial waste 
a waste filling in a lot of the wetlands. <coughs> Uh, but we finally were able to put a stop to the garbage. I mean, it, it was all coming our way. Uh, we were getting it, we had mountains of it, um, and it stunk up the whole area, degraded the value of the property. It was uh, uh, demoralizing to people that, that live there. So I think that we got the moratorium, we got the attention of the city, and then the state and the county all to adopt regulations on landfilling. Uh, hopefully we're gonna find a solution to landfilling. We, and, and the only, the, the major solution is the three R's that we hear about all the time, reduce, reuse, recycle, um, and, and reduce the amount of waste that we produce. But um, at least we don't have it right near human populations anymore, the landfill uh, the material that goes out on city trucks out of the city now, take it to rural areas. Uh, unfortunately, some people might accuse us of not in my backyard, but um, at least it's not right next to human beings' um, habitation. Um, so I, I would point to that as first and foremost. And, and we've kind of turned turn the thought around, or, or at least we're, we're still striving to turn things around to where they don't just look at, a, as, at our area as a place to just dump on and bring their waste to. Uh, so I would count that in stopping the Lucadia um, coal gasification plant was a major victory for us, we thought. Um, and uh, of course, we're still, we're still hopeful. We don't want the pet coke in our backyard, but the regulations have helped. It's already reduced the amount of fugitive dust coming off. We have captured the attention uh, not only of uh, local uh, officials, but the state and federal officials. And uh, last August, a year ago in August, when there was a huge storm, a big windstorm carried off um, an enormous amount of dust, uh, black, uh, black in the whole sky, and it was captured on a video and captured in a uh, snapshot by a, a resident who happened to be one of our uh, members and uh, put that up and that became viral and it really brought home just how how bad the uh, pet coke uh, was and, and by bringing our legislators into it and getting regulations done I think was a major achievement that we've had. And uh, stopping the firing range, we love that. We made up t-shirts with a with an eagle's claws holding a, a, a pistol and uh, and just, you know, uh, we really thought that was great to preserve those 33 acres, which are really bounded by landfills, but just a beautiful, uh, untouched place that used to be, uh, uh, well, we still have, have some wetlands there and, and some forest and stuff. So it's a great place. We, we've found more uh, eagles now, at least three nesting areas of, uh, of that rare bird in this area. So. Well, uh, to ask a related question, I'm so accustomed from reading the news that uh, politicians sacrifice the ideal idealistic interests of local groups uh, uh, over to, they give in to large corporate interests, especially those that can give campaign contributions and stuff like that. So yeah. do you think it was that there were times when um, your groups were able to defeat the local politicians who were in the pocket of the corporate interests? Or did uh, you find federal regulations that you could go into court and defeat uh, local practices? Or were you really dependent on the goodwill and good faith of uh, legislators? Mm -hmm. Well, nothing works like uh, shaking up a politician where his job might be in death jeopardy. Uh, a great example of this was we were part of the Clean Power Coalition in Chicago. It was, uh, uh, maybe 30 or 40 different groups came together to close the coal-fired power plants. I know you had Kim Wasserman here from the Little Village Environmental <coughs> Justice Organization uh, in the past. I'm sure she talked about that because that was the major achievement getting the Fisk and Crawford plants, and by the way, we had our own, and you know, it's a, uh, uh, what's that type of architecture that you're, uh, Art Deco, Art Deco, beautiful uh, facility, but unfortunately, they were burning coal out there, so uh, 
we were we came together with those other groups to close the coal-fired power plants and in that case uh, you know the daily administration didn't want to touch that and we could couldn't get a hearing we had one alderman uh, Joe Moore from the north side who was willing to carry a, a resolution to, to close down the power plants but he couldn't get a call because you know they have this the strange way of uh, 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 doing business down at City Hall where they can bury something in a committee and it doesn't come out of committee and, and it wasn't going anywhere until the um, uh, one alderman who had the uh, Fisk plant in his ward and the, uh, what ward is Danny Solis, and you might have heard of him, he's, he's very close to the mayor and a, a very influential alderman, got the scare of his life uh, thinking he was going to walk away with, with an easy victory four years ago. Um, and uh, got put into a runoff and suddenly changed his vote and changed his mind and was able to pull that out of committee and wanted to become the champion of it. And I, I, I remember the day when we had cameras like this here and we were holding a press conference on the fifth floor of City Hall where we had been banging on the door for months and months and months to uh, get a hearing and to get the city council to take up this cause to shut down the power plants. And I put a sign right in Danny Solis's hand. I said, are you willing to take this sign and hold it up? And he did, he joined us and it was, you know, close those plants or uh, we, we need our air or whatever that was. When he did that, it pivoted uh, on that issue. It changed the whole thing and we were able to get that ordinance passed, Mayor Emanuel was early in his administration and um, became the champion of that, I guess you could say. But So uh, I guess to answer the question, on a national level, I mean, we all just saw an election occur where uh, I think it's gonna make things really, really more difficult. I've been involved in politics since I was seven years old, so that's a long, long time because I grew up in a ward where that was every four years, uh, everything became exciting and I thought, golly, everything's exciting around here. And I got involved when I was just a little kid and uh, passing out stuff up and down the streets. I think that we really need to be in the political. I'm not promoting parties or, or um, I think that the only way is to get involved and to encourage people to become involved. And people are really despondent today. And I know I am, I am from the last election because we now have leaders who are uh, probably going to answer more toward their major donors, and those are the polluters, unfortunately, and the, this is big time stuff now. Uh, the pipeline, uh, we know just the other day, didn't, um, didn't make it, but it's going to be coming back again. I, I don't know if the president's going to be able to hold strong, and I don't know if, uh, if they're going to be able to turn that back or not. But it's on a, on a national level, it's tough for us. On a local level, if we can apply right now, our alderman in this 10th ward has about six or seven challengers and about five of them got their legs by organizing with us on the pet coke and the previous Lucadia and some of the other environmental issues. So environment is a big uh, deal out in our area and uh, it's, a, it's a pressure point for the alderman there. So on the local level we can affect change pretty well I think. And our state reps have been pretty responsible and uh, Congresswoman Kelly jumped on this pet coke issue right away and demanded that the um, Centers for Disease Control uh, conduct a study because we still don't know what kind of effects breathing that stuff in uh, has so we're still hoping that we're going to get that happen and, and maybe some national legislation but it's it looks bleak right now unfortunately. Mike? Um. <clears throat> I don't know how to say this without sounding sentimental or cheesy, but I'm going to say it anyway. I think all of us who live in and around Chicago should thank you and the Southeast Environmental Task Force and other organizations for fighting those fights over a period of years through times of adversity with virtually no resources to get the environmental protections and regulations that we have. That list that you showed on that slide, it's easy in a sort of PowerPoint thing. Ah, it's just slide 14 on my presentation. Any one of those lines just got, I was thunderstruck looking at that list of what you've accomplished with the organization. It's amazing. And so I'm, I'm grateful to you. Thank you.
and, and what's, what's going on in our area really does affect the entire city, and, and it's not like we're just one ward or, or that corner of the city. Um, I, was, I just came back from a conference last weekend in Carbondale, and one of the slides, one of the other presenters was from a, a tar sands um, pipeline opposition and, and showed a map of the United States, and it's not just the Keystone Pipeline, but the pipelines are all over the place. And, and it turned out that Chicago has become the epicenter for this refining. refining and uh, now they want to bring freighters down uh, carrying oil on the lake. And then they're already carrying pet coke. If just one of those tankers goes down, just one, it can pollute the drinking water for millions and millions of people just instantly. And this tar sand stuff is really difficult. It's not like that spill in the Gulf, which was worse than they make it out to be, we know that. Uh, but the tar sand stuff is altogether different because it sinks and it can't just be vacuumed out or, or dispersed and stuff like that. It forms tar balls and it is just really difficult to get rid of. So my point is, Chicago and on the whole has, uh, I appreciate the compliment, that's very kind of you to say that, but Chicago on the whole has this issue to deal with, I think. Tankers all are going to be emitting all these extra greenhouse gases too. So there's, you know, follow on effects. Yep, we're breathing it every day. Mm -hmm. Could I ask one more quick question? Oh, you had. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, you, you know, you showed a slide where you had various officials out on tours of the Calumet region. Yep. And that is, appears to be a strategy that's worked pretty well for you. Getting people on site, seeing things with their own eyes, telling your story in C2, if you will, you know, in the place rather than in a boardroom or, right. or somewhere else. How, hopefully there's no bowls from the EPA here right now. How good a partner has the Illinois EPA been with your organization over the years? Have they been an ally all the time? Have you had to kind of drag them into it? I know that there's, there were some issues in terms of getting them to wake up to the Petco controversy the last sure. couple of years. Sure. Yeah. Uh, if you could comment on that a little bit. None of these agencies act real fast. I mean, it's not like you can make a phone call and, and have them come out the next day. It's 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 a slow turnaround for them. Uh, I would say, on the whole, especially uh, the U.S. EPA has uh, recently they they came out the other day to interview us and and uh, to film us as well because they wanted to use us to uh, bring back to the national to show how involved they had been and, and I was you know surprised at just how much they have been doing with us and for us uh, recently. Illinois EPA uh, sort of too um, but like I say they didn't they didn't respond right away uh, they needed they needed to hear from our community and the community you could see they were pretty worked up when we held our, our first community meeting about the pet coke issue we had it in a little field house, which is about half of this room, because we expected to have about 30 or 40 people, and we had 120 people come out. They were all the way outside in, in a, a ring around the building. Uh, so <laughs> our next community uh, meeting, we had to expand and go to a larger place, and, and we had over 125 seats, and every seat filled, and you know, over 150 people in overflow crowd, and when we brought them out and put them on the hot seat, I think they went back to the director and said, hey, uh, something's, something's going on out there and we gotta take a close look. And when we found out that uh, Lisa Bonnet was uh, going to be speaking at the Union League Club on a day that was a little colder than yesterday even, last year, but uh, she was there to give a presentation. We didn't let that opportunity go by. We had uh, maybe about uh, 15, 20 people come out early on a weekday morning and stand around uh, at the entrance and let her know. She came out afterwards and, and addressed us, and it was right after that that she denied the, the Koch brothers a permit to continue their expansion at that plant. So um, we're able to, to move them, but it's not always, uh, you know, doesn't happen real fast and doesn't always go our way either. Where there's a lot of permits that are issued that we don't think should have ever been issued. Those those piles, it'd be a long walk, but you could 
walk from those piles to Lake Michigan. Yeah. You know, and 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 so I mean, so my question, you know, so I mean, that is drinking water. I mean, it's right now. I, I just my gut tells me that stuff is going into the city's drinking water supply already. Yeah, me too. Because the minute particles come off of those piles, very small. In fact, Joe, if you would hand me that. Uh, I'm going to, uh, yeah. guess what? I brought some pet coke along because there's a, a young man that's going, I don't know if that's him poking his head in here. If it is, if, uh, is he from the uh, School of the Art Institute? Because we had a group of uh, about 80 students from the Art Institute, School of the Art Institute, come out a couple of weeks ago uh, to do a uh, mapping project, balloon mapping project. We brought a uh, uh, one of the pleasure boats that you know from downtown moors out our, our way and uh, took us out along the river so they could map and, and photograph the uh, pet coke from above. So he asked me if I could get him a little sample and I'll be happy to pass this around. Are you from the School of Art, Art Institute? I have your pet coke, but before you get it, <laughs> before you get it, I'm going to pass it around so everybody can have a look at it up close. And you know, I, I don't suggest anybody breathes this stuff, but every time it's disturbed, like if I were to just move it around, a little puff of it goes into the atmosphere. So you can imagine just how easy, how easy it blows off of the piles there and how it can get out into the atmosphere. Were you on the boat with us there yeah, a couple of yeah. yeah. So you got to see everything up close. Yeah. yeah. So? So this, this is uh, real fine. It's not, not like coal. You know, coal is uh, like a big heavy rock. And uh, this stuff uh, comes that way or it comes pelletized. Uh, there's a couple of different ways it comes out of the refineries. And uh, if, I mean, just touching the jar isn't going to harm you, but you don't want to uh, shake it up and breathe too much of that stuff. And the, the fact that, like, for those of you that can't see it as well, the fact that, like, little puff comes up like every single time like that's moved at all I and mean, it really gives you a sense of how pliable that is and how far it's going to go even with any wind yeah you saw me spill some at the office i think and, and right. yeah a puff of dust goes up so each time that one of the conveyors kicks in or each time one of those loaders picks some up and drops it uh, a lot of this dust just goes into the atmosphere. So one of the other requirements that the city uh, required was that they have uh, air monitors all around the property. So we're beginning to get the reports from those air monitors. There were a couple of months that they exceeded the uh, uh, what what they consider a dangerous level, and uh, so they got cited for those uh, violations and. And uh, they're claiming that they're trying to do the right thing and, and uh, to have them spend $100 million, uh, I guess it's a big investment. They know they have a problem there. So back to your question, whether the study has been done, which it has not, and, and we're a little bit uh, dissatisfied with that, but they know, I think, that the stuff is traveling, that it is going into our rivers and the lake, and that it is being breathed by people and that it is going to have some harmful effects. Otherwise, I don't think that they would be too uh, eager to go and spend that kind of money for the improvements that they have to do. Joe? Well, I, I salute you for all the volunteer work that you've done over the years. If uh, somebody wanted to make a career of environmental justice work, are there any salaried positions available, either in government agencies or in the private sector? I think there's always uh, jobs available in, in uh, governmental agencies. I, I hope that uh, what we've been fearing, you know, that the new administration uh, and Congress might be, begin to gut the uh, EPA. I hope that doesn't happen, but there, you know, there's always jobs um, in uh, government agencies. As far as the, the national agencies, I know there's job openings. There, there are websites and uh, uh, there's a green jobs network out there. Uh, a lot of them are entry level. Some of them don't pay very well. Um, we're going to be visited if anybody's interested in environmental law. Um, after I leave this meeting, I'm going across the way or through some 
uh, secret passage over to the other side of the university here for the Chicago Recycling Coalition meeting where we're going to have Natalie Lisek, I think her name is, who is an attorney who's really dedicated to the environmental movement. She would probably tell you that she's not getting rich being a lawyer. Now, some lawyers can get rich. Uh, other lawyers have a passion for uh, this movement, and um, uh, she's making a living at it, I hope. Um, and so I think that there's, there's uh, opportunities there in the legal aspect, and the scientific, of course, and, and in recycling. When we took recycling tour, there are, there are jobs and, and uh, there are solutions that have to be found. So I hope that there's always going to be jobs there and that, that we begin to fund some of these solutions and uh, provide those jobs. And besides, I'll come to you in a second, besides those uh, jobs, those paying jobs, we also have some wonderful volunteer opportunities for anybody who would like to come out and, and work with us or even remotely, uh, particularly in two areas where we're a little bit deficient. You might have already gathered that I'm not uh, really up on today's technology and some of us that are in the organization don't have the uh, technical ability, so we're looking for a social media person uh, and a person that can work with uh, computers and, and helping us to get the message out and stuff like that. And secondly, we're, uh, we have a great need for someone that can sit down and do some writing and researching and finding grant monies that keep an organization like ours in existence because without grant money and a little bit of fundraising that we do, we're not gonna be able to you know, pay the heat bills and pay the rent and stuff like that. So uh, there are two great needs there and uh, other things too. Yeah, Mike, uh, last question. question. You um, <clears throat> told us a little bit about the Millennium Preserve mm -hmm. uh, project, which was recently, uh, I know a lot of momentum has been building toward that and the governor uh, uh, signed off on it and that's underway. There's been a couple decades worth of planning for the Calumet region. Right, how it's going to be revitalized industrially and environmentally. Right. At the same time, you know, your organization is still fighting all these battles with waste and landfilling and pollution. Yeah. Um, could you give us a, a quick soundbite of why this Millennium Reserve project is a big deal? And, uh, sure. Why, why the Millennium Reserve? Yeah. Uh, it means a lot to us uh, because that's part of the image problem that. The, the, the image change that we had been hoping for was to make our place a little bit more of a destination for the good things that we saw, the, the places uh, to fish and uh, uh, windsurfing on the lake and uh, bird watching and uh, taking advantage of some of the wonderful amenities that we have. Um, and uh, to me, uh, on a personal level, I would much rather be working on trails and uh, uh, working on these bike paths and stuff like that than having to go out uh, to demonstrate on the bridge or to um, uh, seeing this ugly pollution and, and things like that. Uh, we, there's so much good that, that uh, can be found from, from uh, Gary, which is a, another industrial um, scarred area, but, but you have beautiful lakefront there. You have wonderful amenities at the Indiana Dunes State Park and, and at Wolf Lake and at Lake Calumet and uh, opening Pullman to become a national park. All of these wonderful things that are going to make our area more of a, a tourist destination or more of a spot that people are going to uh, want to come out and visit for the good things rather than just drive by holding their nose or uh, going by like so many of the people who came out on our tour said, you know, I just never gave this place a look before. I just used it as a place to get from point A in the city to point B out in Michigan or Ohio or Indiana. So I think we could become that destination place for, for good things. So thank you very much. I think that's about time. Thanks for having me today.